right, how we doing? It is good to see all of you. So glad that you're here today. And uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us from our campuses and Ada Bible Church Online. And special welcome to you if you are joining us from someplace warmer than here. I hesitate to tell you that there was snow in the air on my way in this morning, but we're not jealous. It's fine. So glad that you're someplace warm and having a great time with your family. And uh, hey, if we haven't met, my name is Aaron, and I'm the director of student ministries here, one of the teaching pastors, and I'm just uh, so looking forward to our time together today as we get to open the scriptures together, continuing this series called Correcting Spiritual Drift. And uh, last week, if you were with us, uh, I told a story about how in my early 20s, I transitioned from a full-time water well driller to youth pastor, and it was a pretty dramatic change in my life. Uh, But something that I didn't talk too much about was that this water well drilling thing goes like way back in my family. Like I am a fifth or was a fifth generation water well driller, as in like my great, great grandfather was a well driller. So I brought a picture today From way back in the olden days, (laughs) this is a picture of uh, the family business. I think this is in uh, the 60s maybe, but this guy right here is my great-grandfather, Robert. Uh, He was usually called Bob. These are some of his boys who worked. And uh, I want to work with him, and I want to draw your attention to the sign. This is a classic. Uh, If you can't read it, it says, Robert Buer and Sons. And I just love these old signs. It's like so-and-so and and sons. And I just think that it's so cool. But uh, something about having your name on the sign of your business is that if my great-grandfather hired somebody uh, to to work for him, to to drive his trucks or to operate the drilling equipment, there's kind of this understanding like, hey, understand, um, as you do your work, that, uh, that, that's my name on the sign. And so, uh, you know, the attitude that you bring and the quality of your work and, and even the tone of conversation that you have with our customers, uh, that's my name on the sign. And so this is my reputation that's on the line. And uh, some of you know what this is like because uh, some of you are small business owners and perhaps you even have the name, uh, your last name on your sign. And uh, others of us know what this is like because we have children. And uh, there's this funny thing that happens in you when your kids uh, get recognized either for good or for bad outside of the home, right? It's like when your son scores a touchdown or you get a call from the police station, it's like, uh, that's my name, (laughs) you're representing me. Uh, So our conversation today is a conversation about reputation, Uh, but about God's reputation. In, uh, In our story today, God's reputation has been dragged through the mud. It's been tarnished. Uh, You might even say his name has been trashed. And this has happened at the hands of his own people, Israel. Uh, Here's a map. Uh, God rescued his people out of slavery in Egypt, and he set them up as a, as a nation here in the land that was, was called Canaan, and it became uh, the land of Israel. And uh, he set it up here like a crossroads of trade, because over here is a desert. You wouldn't travel through there, and, and if you wanted to go by boat, you could. But if it was a caravan by land, you were going to pass through Israel on your way to Africa or Europe or Asia. And I I think the idea here is that all the people of the surrounding nations, that when they encountered God's people, that they would experience a little of what God was like, that they would experience his goodness and his power. I mean, it's almost like this, this nation, this people is like a sign, and God's name is on the sign, and they were supposed to carry his name well. But, uh... In the stories that we've been looking at in this series, uh, they're not carrying his name well. Uh, Many in Israel have forgotten about their God, and many are worshiping the gods of the surrounding nations like Baal and Asherah, and, and so God's name has been dragged through the mud. And so what God desires to do in our story today is he seeks to reclaim his name. He wants to restore his reputation. And he's going to do it through his servant, Elisha the prophet. 
And the specific setting for our story today is a war. A war between Aram and Israel because the king of Aram is sending armed soldiers, these bands of raiders, into Israel's territory and they are burning crops. They are pillaging villages. They are killing people and they are taking slaves back into Aram. And it's an ugly time for the people of Israel. But it's in this context, in this setting, that God desires to reclaim his name. Now, you may be wondering, why does God care so much about his name, about his reputation? I mean, he's God. Does, Does he really need this? But I think the truth is that uh, it's really about us. Because when we think little of God, we miss big. I mean, when we think little of God's name, we really miss out big time. And this is because God is the source of all that is good. I mean, God is the source of light and love, and life, and goodness, and joy, and peace. Uh, Every good thing that we experience in this life is a gift from God. And so when we think little of God, I think we miss big, because when we put God in his proper place in our lives, when we make him central, when when we think much of God, I believe that we begin to experience life the way that God designed it for us. That when we walk with God and when we're close with God, that that we experience uh, so much more of what God intended. And isn't it true, a series about correcting spiritual drift, isn't it true that in times of spiritual drift that we often think little of God? And we don't put God in that central place in our lives. And I just believe in seasons like that, we miss so much of what God intends for us. And so my hope for today, as we engage this conversation about God's reputation, that that those of us who are in a season of spiritual drift or or maybe just a a week of spiritual drift, that God would recapture our minds and, and recapture our hearts with who he is and that we would remember his greatness. We would think greatly of him and that we would restore him to the his proper place in our lives. And so just to let you know kind of where we're headed, we're going to jump into this story of God seeking to reclaim his name. And along the way, we're going to discover uh, three declarations that God makes about himself. Uh, Three times where he says something very important about his character as he seeks to reclaim his reputation. So jumping back into our story, there's a war going on. And the king of Aram, he's sending these raiders into Israel. And uh, you got to understand, this is a very lucrative deal for the king of Aram. I mean, every time he sends these troops in, they come back with plunder. They come back with money. They come back with slaves. I mean, every raid makes Aram a little bit stronger and Israel a little bit weaker. And so this is a very lucrative deal for the king of Aram. Uh, That is until one day when the raiders start coming back empty-handed. And it happens again and again. And it's like, hey, what's the deal? Where's the plunder? (laughs) And his soldiers are like, look, Israel, they're, they're always one step ahead of us. It's like they know our playbook. They're always gone or they show up with a stronger force. And here's what's going on is the man of God, and that's Elisha the prophet, the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. And uh, so the king of Israel, he checked on that place indicated by the man of God and time and again, so not a one-time deal, but over and over, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. What's happening here? is that the God of Israel is somehow sending word to Elisha, hey, they're going to be over there, or they're going to be heading down into this valley, or that 
village, and then Elisha is sending messages to the king of Israel who listens and takes action and either moves the people out of harm's way or perhaps moves troops uh, into the way of the Aramaeans so that these raids become ineffective. God is sending warnings to the people of Israel to protect them, to keep them out of trouble. And I just believe that God is saying, hey, uh, remember me? The God that so many of you have forgotten, the God that you've been unfaithful to, I'm still here. And I need you to know that I'm still strong and I'm still powerful. And I need you to know that I desire to protect you. And I think this is God's heart for his people and he wants to reclaim his reputation. Understand, I desire to protect you. And so he sends messages of warning through the prophet Elisha to the king of Israel to protect his people. And you know, there's just something uh, that comes to mind and I think about this, like wouldn't it be amazing if God still did this? Like sent warnings to his people to keep them out of trouble? Like imagine tomorrow morning you open up your email and there's this email and it looks very unique. And it says, do not go to your usual lunch spot, all caps, trust me, hashtag salmonella, sincerely God. It'd be like, <laughs> whoa, right? I mean, but for real, wouldn't it be amazing, wouldn't it be awesome if God still sent warning messages to his people to keep them out of trouble? Wouldn't that be absolutely incredible? Um, I think he still does. I think God still warns his people of trouble out of a desire to protect his people. This book, we as followers of Jesus, we believe that these are God's words. Uh, one biblical writer said, these words are God-breathed. It's like God breathed them out to us. And so when we read these words, when we listen to these words, we are hearing the very words of God. And I got to tell you, as you read through these pages, I mean, there's all kinds of warnings. You know, watch out for this. Beware of that. Stay away from this. I think that God still sends warnings to his people. And yet I know that for some of us, this just raises up this resistance because it's like, see, now that's my problem with Christianity. It's like this book and it says rule after rule and commandment after commandment. It's like my way or the highway. You know, if you want to be in with God, you got to follow all the rules. And so I just understand that for some of us, this just brings this resistance. And so I think it's helpful to think about these warnings that God gives us uh, from a slightly different angle. Uh, in an angle that, uh, an image that all of us are familiar with, and, and I'm talking about like traffic signs, like the signs that you see on the side of the road when you're driving your car. This right here is a warning that the road is curving. If you keep driving straight, you're going to have a problem, right? Like there will be uh, you in that field, uh, it's gonna, your car's going to be all torn up, it's bad. Now, I just have this sense that the road commission is not on a power trip when they put a sign like this out by the road, right? It's not like, yeah, we'll show them, we're in charge. No, I think it's a genuine desire to protect people from harm. I mean, this sign is here so that I would be safe, so that the kids in my car would be safe, and that the people around me would be safe. Uh, another sign, uh, do not enter, right? You're driving on the road, you see this, and it's like, okay, why is that there? Well, this is somebody's private property, you don't belong there. Or, you know, in this case, there is no road, you don't want to keep driving here, it's going to be bad. But you see the, the point I'm trying to make. I think that these warnings that we see in Scripture, you have to understand the heart behind them. It's a God who cares about his people and desires to protect his people. And so he says, hey, watch out. Be careful there. It's not a desire to dominate and control in my way or the highway. Now, let me just, uh, let me share a couple actual warnings from Scripture, because I think it's just important to camp out here on this idea for a second. And uh, I'm going to pull uh, three examples from the book of Proverbs. 
uh, Proverbs uh, from the Old Testament, uh, wisdom sayings that King Solomon wrote or collected, and the uh, people of Israel would have been familiar with these, with these warnings. So uh, take a look at this. Uh, pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And this is where we get uh, this phrase that so many of us are familiar with, pride goes before a fall. This is a warning that we find in Scripture where it's like, hey, watch out for this pride thing. Be careful. Uh, th- this is a corner you're gonna wanna take slowly because understand that if pride is an issue in your life, you're gonna have a hard time having healthy relationships if you're never, ever wrong. And, and this issue of pride, a, a lack of humility, I- I'm telling you that promotion will likely continue to elude you if you can't deal with this issue. And so it's a warning. And God is like, listen, I care about you. And so I'm warning you about this issue of pride. Slow down here. Be careful with this one. Uh, Here's another example from the book of Proverbs. Uh, Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. It's a proverb about influence. Understand, if you hang out with wise people, good chance you're going to become wiser. If you hang out with fools, uh, good chance bad things are going to happen. And it's like God is saying, hey, I need to warn you about something because I desire to protect you. Uh, you hang out with fools, I mean, bad things are going to happen. I mean, those of you who have teenagers, this is a regular conversation, right? I remember a conversation, it's like, uh, listen, I know you didn't break into the car, but the people that you were with did, and you were there, and so now you are in a world of trouble. The influence of the people that you hang out with, it matters. Another warning from the Proverbs. For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end she is bitter as gall, which is a word I think it means bile. Sharp as a double-edged sword, her feet go down to death and her steps lead straight to the grave. It's like God is saying, listen, I care about you. And I need to warn you about this something. Uh, This woman who's not your wife, uh, this man who is not your husband, uh, this is not gonna end well. Eugene Peterson, who gave us the message, he said, this is how it's gonna end. Gravel in your mouth, a pain in your side, and a wound in your heart. And so we get these warnings all throughout scripture. And I think it's just so important that we understand the heart behind them. It's a God whose character is good that he desires to protect his people. And so he issues warnings, watch out for this, beware of that, look out for this. And he sends these messages to the king of Israel. And I think it's just important to remember what the king of Israel did with those messages. He listened to them and he took action. The scripture says he was on his guard against such places. And I just wonder as we walk through these warnings or you think about this idea of God warning us, if something comes to mind that you just sense like, "Ah, I think God is, is warning me about this. Could I encourage you? Listen to him because he cares and take action. Do not ignore the warning. So there's a war going on. And God keeps sending these warnings to the king of Israel. And it's working out pretty well for the people of Israel because they're staying one step ahead. Now, the king of Aram, who had this lucrative deal going, uh, it's not working out so good for him. And uh, he's not happy about it, not in the slightest. Check this out. This enraged the king of Aram. And he summoned his officers and he demanded of them, tell me. Which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? I know that we have a mole in the camp. Which one of you is it? Which one of you is giving information to the Israelites? 
None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, he tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. <laughs> Listen, he not only knows what's going on in the war room, he knows what's going on in your bedroom. And the king is like, this isn't working for me. And so here we go. Go, find out where he is, the king ordered. He sends out his spies so I can send men to capture him. We got to get these, this guy. He's too powerful. He's too good. We got to capture him. And continues on. And the report came back. He is in Dothan. Elisha, we know where he is. Now, where is Dothan? Here's a map. Dothan is in Israel. It's relatively close to Aram. And uh, what do you need to know about Dothan? Small town. I think it's pretty unlikely that they had uh, city walls. I think it's pretty unlikely that there was a garrison of soldiers there. And now the Arameans have found Elisha. And so here we read, Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and they surrounded the city. It's like, we got him. We got this guy who keeps giving all the information, the intel to the Israelites. And so the next morning... When the servant of the man of God, so Elisha has a servant with him, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. What shall we do? What are we gonna do? I just imagine he looks out from the doorway or whatever it is and just sees horses and chariots, soldiers with spears and swords, bows and arrows. I mean, they are surrounded. They are trapped. They are in real trouble here. There's no way out. Doomed. And he says, what are we going to do? And I just got to believe he's thinking, we are not getting out of this one. We are not getting out of this one unscathed trapped. And I wonder if you've been there. I wonder if you've been there recently. We are not getting out of this one. It's like you watch the pile of bills climb at the same time watching the credit card balance up and up. And you just realize, I, I don't think we're going to be able to keep the house through this. We are not getting out of this one. It's when you realize that the fracture in the relationship has become this chasm and it's, there's not even common ground to talk about the issues anymore. I don't think we're getting out of this one. It's when your son says, don't bring up the Jesus thing again. And you just have this memory of this little boy singing, Jesus loves me, this I know, and now he is a man who has walked away from faith. And you just have this thought, I don't think we're getting out of this one. It's when the tests come back and the cancer has returned and it's not good. I don't think we're getting out of this one. And I wonder if you've been there. Elisha and his servant, totally surrounded by an army, no way out. And I just need to know how God, who desires to protect, is going to meet them in that space. Because I want to know how he's going to meet us in our space, in the desperate situations that we find ourselves in. And so here's what happens. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And if I'm the servant, I'm thinking, okay, hundreds of soldiers, chariots, and horses, you and me. Uh, dude, are you losing your mind? <laughs> so what happens here? Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened his servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And if I'm understanding this right, it is like an army of God's angels that suddenly the servant is able to see. They were there and he was totally unaware. And, and Elisha says, Lord, open his eyes. And the servant realize, realizes we are not alone. 
We are not alone and we never were. God shows up here powerfully. He is present with this army of angels. And it's like God is saying, hey, there's something I need you to remember about me. I'm reclaiming my reputation. There's something that you gotta know about me and that is I am powerfully present with my people. I am powerfully present with you. And in this story, he shows up with an army of angels. And something I believe is that God was powerfully present with his people in the past, and I believe that he is powerfully present with his people today. And sometimes he shows up with an army of fiery chariots and horses, and sometimes he is powerfully present in other ways. Sometimes he's powerfully present through an encouraging note from a friend that comes at just the right time and contains just the right words to lift your spirit out of a dark place. And sometimes God is powerfully present through the generosity of his people. I remember uh, several years ago, my wife had just given birth to our third child and I remember strapping three car seats with three small kids into the back seat of a Pontiac Bonneville. And I'm looking at all these car seats and this, all these seat belts going, I don't think this is gonna work. <laughs> but we didn't have the money at that time to buy something bigger. And that's when a friend, uh, somebody from our church said, hey, are you interested in a used van? And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> At just the right time, God was powerfully present in our lives through the generosity of his people. Sometimes God does that. Sometimes God is powerfully present through the words of a worship song that just remind you of God's character in a way that you absolutely needed when you listened to that song. And sometimes God is powerfully present through a sermon that is just so on point with what you're experiencing in your life that like with goosebumps, you're like, is God talking directly to me? And you're tempted to just like look around to see if everybody else is looking at you as well. Like, yeah, he's talking to you. <laughs> sometimes God is powerfully present through an army of fiery chariots and horses, and sometimes he's powerfully present in all kinds of different ways. And listen, I don't know what it is that you're facing in your life, what kind of difficult situation that has you going, I, I don't know if we're gonna get out of this. And something else that I don't know is, I, I don't know that God is gonna rescue you from it. I don't know that God will deliver you from that situation. But something that I absolutely believe to be true is that God will be good to you in what you're facing and that he will be powerfully present with you in a hundred different ways. And I believe that if this is true, then we can trust him because we are not alone. And the servant of Elisha, he just didn't know. He had to have his eyes opened to realize that God was with them the entire time. And so just an encouragement for you, if you're facing something very challenging, a prayer that might be helpful this week, God, open my eyes. God, open my eyes to your powerful presence in my life. God, open my eyes to your goodness to me in this time. Because God is powerfully present and you are not alone in what you are facing. So there's this army of Arameans and there's this army of fiery chariots and horses. And I just assuming that the angel army would attack this other army and Elisha and his servant can go back to whatever they were doing. <laughs> but that's not what happens. In fact, uh, the angel army neither attacks nor defends. And the Arameans begin to approach the city. 
And I believe this is because God desires to reclaim his reputation in this story. He wants to restore his name, and there's something else that he needs his people to understand about him. And so here's what happens. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Now, if I'm understanding this word correctly, it's not just blindness like they, they literally couldn't see, but rather uh, like a distortion of perception, like uh, they're seeing one thing but not reality. They're thoroughly confused. And so this is what happens next. Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. It's like, these are not the prophets you are looking for. He throws down some Jedi mind tricks somehow. And so he led them to Samaria. Where's Samaria? Oh, you know, it's right here uh, in the middle of Israel, just the capital city where the king lives with all of his soldiers and armies and everything. Elisha leads them directly into the city of Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so that they can see. And then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. I mean, imagine their eyes are opened and they see horses, chariots, soldiers with spears and swords, bows and arrows, and they have this moment where they just go, what are we going to do? I don't think we're getting out of this one. And it's like, my, my, how the tables have turned. And I just believe that God is seeking to reclaim his reputation in this story. And he wants to remind his people, look, I desire to protect you. And understand that I am powerfully present with you. And remember that I am strong and I am powerful. And now the enemies of Israel are about to discover that you don't mess with God's people. And so when the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? He says it twice. He's chomping at the bit. He's like, hey, these guys killed our people. They burned our crops. They took our children as slaves. Let's kill them. Let's exact vengeance on these people. And Elisha answers, yeah, don't kill them. <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> uh, do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those you have captured with your own sword or bow? If you're in a battle and the army surrenders to you, do you just wipe them out? No, that would be wrong. He says, set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. <laughs> Elisha says, hey, give them a meal and then we'll send them back where they came from. <laughs> uh, Elisha, I don't think I, you understand how this war thing works, okay? <laughs> like we don't just, no. What is going on here? What in the world is happening in this story? Uh, let's go back to a map that we looked at earlier. God rescued Israel for a reason. He brought them out of slavery and he set them up here. And it's like this nation is like a sign with God's name on it. And the idea is, look, all these people, when they come through and when they're trading and when they're traveling, they, they might encounter the people of God and they might experience the character of God. That they might know that the God of Israel, the one true God, that he's a good God. That he's a powerful God. And I think what's happening here is God is reminding his people of a reality about himself, and that is he wants to be known. There's something that you need to know about me. I desire to be known. And not only that, I, I want to be known through you, my people. I want to be known through you, Israel. And you've forgotten this. And so this story takes place where God shows up in some really unexpected and powerful ways, but he wants to remind his people. Do you remember the promise I gave to your ancestor Abraham? Through you, I will bless all peoples. Do you remember that? Do you remember my heart and who I am? He's trying to recapture their attention. And so the story ends like this. So he prepared a great feast as a king. And after they had finished eating and drinking, which wouldn't it be fun to just know what that conversation was like? Uh, hey, have you ever been to Dothan? Uh, vague memories, don't really, okay. He sent them away, and they returned to their master. 
and this is huge. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. <laughs> they go back home. And what were those conversations like? Uh, tell me, what, okay, what happened? Yeah, no, the God of Israel captured us. And instead of the sword, we got hospitality. And it's like their minds are just blown. <laughs> and when the king's like, yeah, it's time to get back on the road. We're going back raiding into Israel. They're, uh, no, I'm not going. <laughs> now, you can't pay me enough to go back there. I'm not messing with that God. And I wonder if some of them just completely lost their appetite for violence. And I wonder if some of them began worshiping Yahweh. You see, God orchestrated this situation to remind his people, I desire to be known. I desire to be enjoyed, and I want to be known through you. I believe that that was true then, and I believe it is true for us today, that God desires to be known through you. Because through Christ, we are his people. We are the church. We are the children of God, and God desires to be known through you. That those who don't believe might experience the goodness of God when they encounter somebody who does believe. And somebody who is far from God might experience the kindness of God when they bump into somebody who is close with God. And that somebody who has chosen against the ways of God might experience the love of God when they enter into a conversation with somebody who has chosen to embrace the ways of God. God desires to be known through you. Which brings us back to this classic sign Robert Buer and Sons. I think you and I are like a sign, and God's name is on the sign. And we carry God's reputation, we carry his name. And so I wonder how you're doing with that. In your interactions with your neighbors, your teammates, your coworkers. I wonder how well you're representing God's character, his heart, his message of reconciliation through Jesus on the cross. I wonder how you're doing with that. And so my prayer for you, my hope for you this week, is that the people that you interact with would experience the goodness of God through your actions, and through your words, as you and I seek to carry the reputation, the name of our God as well as we can. I'd love to pray for you as we wrap up our time. Father God, uh, we're grateful for this story where you reveal your character, where you seek to restore your name. And God, as we just explore these ideas uh, I recognize that some of us have a warning from you that we need to take action on. And God, would you give us the courage to do that? And would you surround us with people who would encourage us to do what we need to do? And God, would you remind us of your heart when we run into these difficult warnings would you remind us that you love us and you desire to protect us? And God, I know that for some of us, when we talk about carrying your name, there's a specific person that comes to mind that we know you want us to reach out to. God, would you give us the words? Would you give us the ability to share your love so that you can be known so that you can be enjoyed and so that the people around us can experience more and more of the life that you desire for them. God, we love you. We're grateful for your son, Jesus, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Hey, thanks so much for being here. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next time.